That's the point. I'm, I'm a little vague about cars larger than a red Mazda. <laughs> well, it's amalgamated a, with a TARDIS, so it's probably plenty of room for it. Yeah. Okay. Right, so we're all live on YouTube. Well, it's better than my bike for that point of view, anyway. Right, okay, here's the YouTube link. Russell coming through. I'll put it on the live chat. Just a note there, Noel. I could hear Ken talking about the Red Mazda, and I assume no, no, it's fine. through your YouTube. Yeah, I, I muted that straight away. Uh, okay. It's fine. It's, that's 10 seconds behind. YouTube is about 10 or 15 seconds behind us. So you've got 10 or 15 seconds to swear, I suppose. Uh, okay, where are we? Where's the chat line? So I'm just going to send this message to Russell. Oh, yeah, and Sam and Hannah, just one thing. If there's any problems with the sound, uh, rather than me sort of shouting across, turn up the guitar, whatever, or something, I'll put a discreet message on the on the chats just for you to see. If you, Are you able to see that while you're playing? This is for emergencies only. I will be sort of saying a bit more on the volume, a bit more on the on the bass, just in case there's a complete disaster, like feedback or something. Is that okay? Yeah, no worries. Brilliant. Okay. So, oh, it's not quite eight o'clock. Everyone, there's a great crowd outside already. So it's, this is good. You draw a big crowd, you a lot. Thank you very much. Do do do. So normally Russell does lots of bad jokes. Ken, have you got your jokes lined up? I'm afraid not, no. I'm <laughs> terrible for bad jokes. Well, I, I have bad jokes, but you, you wouldn't want to hear them. Not, not oh, bad. come on. Have you heard Russell's? <laughs> you just have to use charm instead, Ken. Uh, <laughs> Witten charm, yes. Why don't you do that, Russell? No, too difficult. <laughs> Oh, I'll play more gammon tonight. Uh, this might be voting Tory or something. Okay. Uh, right. Are we ready to rock and roll? It's a second. You come back. I'll do it for now. Okay, look. Right, I'm about to let everybody in then, folks. Okay. All working well. Right, they're coming in. Hello, everybody. Come on in. Come on into to Shaw Infinity's Event Horizon, number 67 in the series that will never end. Make yourselves comfortable. Hope you've all got a cup of tea. Oh, hello, Donna. Nice to see you. Ah, Simon. Some old favourites and some new people as well. Can you make yourself comfortable? We're just waiting for everyone to come in before we begin. Uh, my name's Noel Chidwick. I'm behind the scenes uh, looking after the buttons and knobs and all those sort of things. Gosh, you're a fine-looking audience tonight. You're looking relaxed and comfortable and ready for action. Ken McLeod's promised his best worst jokes. Uh, Charlie's got some even better ones. Justina's got some cracking dirty stories to tell. And Tasha can does a, does a fine tap dance, I'm told. Excellent. And we've got some cracking music, and that's not a joke. I'm looking forward to that very much. Did a great sound check yesterday morning. So I woke up, got a mug of tea, and I was play that live from New Zealand. It's a fantastic way to wake up. I recommend it strongly. Get your own online private performance every morning. Okay. Right. Well, I think we've got a good crowd in. Everyone's looking comfortable. So I'm about to hand over. So my name is Noel Trudick, as I said, for editor of Shoreline Infinity. And we run the Shoreline Infinity Event Horizons. But tonight, we're going to leave it in the hands of Ken McLeod, who's going to look after you now. Ken, over to you. Thank you, Noel. And thank you all for coming. 
to this, the X event horizon, the, the part of an infinite series, as Noel said, the nth event horizon. And tonight we have live from the wonderful world of tomorrow, we have Hannah and Sam, I'll introduce you all briefly, Tasha from London, Justina from somewhere in England, I'm not going to give away her location, but she's obviously in a secure, a secure environment, and Charlie Stross, not necessarily in that order. The conceit of this evening, if I may say so, is that I got really um, fed up of seeing celebrities doing uh, road trips. So I thought it's time I did a road trip and one world meeting, meeting interesting people and getting them to talk to camera. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to our folk and fantasy and science fiction music stars from the wonderful world of Friday, the 16th of April, live from the future. Hannah and Sam, take it away. Good morning from Friday. Don't worry, we won't tell you how the day ends. <laughs> we'll leave it as a surprise <laughs> for you. Um, we're really delighted to be joining you. We've gotten up early here in New Zealand um, to share some music with you. And um, we're going to be playing two songs for you today. So our first one we'll play um, is they've bo both been written um, exclusively for this event. So the first one is a song called Swan Song. Uh, it's based on the story of Swan Lake and it's a tale about the um, fortitude and power of women. Is that coming through? i mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Hannah and Sam. You're already very well known in New Zealand and from this you're now well known internationally and I hope you will be even more so. I will, I will introduce you rather more later on, in, later on in this event, which as Noel has reminded me is a science fiction and fantasy cabaret. And for our first reader, I'd like to invite Tasha Suri whose Indian-inspired fantasy novels, Emperor of Sand and Realm of Ash and the forthcoming, in June 2021, The Jasmine Throne, have been acclaimed. And, you know, the third volume of this trilogy is <laughs> eagerly anticipated. I would like, thank, like to thank Tasha and ask her to read from her work. Over to you, Tasha. Oh, um, Hannah and Sam, that was so beautiful. I just have to say, um, really enjoyed it. So thank you for sharing it. If you hear meowing in the background, it's my cat. She's just decided to walk in. I can't do anything about her. Um, but I am going to be reading uh, the prologue because everybody loves a prologue in fantasy, of course. Um, of The Jasmine Throne, which is the start of a new trilogy called um, The Burning Kingdoms. The cover looks like this. I'm showing you just so you can admire it while I try and find my right place in the book because I didn't use a bookmark like a sensible person. Um, but I hope you like a little bit of melodrama. To warn you, it contains uh, significant violence, if that bothers anybody. Um, but hopefully at whatever time you are in your time zone, that's something that will refresh you. So um, I will begin reading now. In the court of the Imperial Mahal, the pyre was being built. The fragrance of the gardens drifted in through the high windows. Sweet roses and even sweeter Imperial needle flower, pale and fragile, growing in such thick profusion that it poured in through the lattice its white petals unfurled against the sandstone walls. The priests flung petals on the pyre murmuring prayers as the servants carried in wood and arranged it carefully, applying camphor and ghee, scattering drops of perfumed oil. On his throne, Emperor Chandra murmured along with his priests. In his hands, he held a string of prayer stones, each an acorn seeded with the name of a mother of flame. As he recited his courtiers, the kings of Parijad Dvipa's city-states, their princely sons, their bravest warriors, recited along with him. Only the king of Alor and his brood of nameless sons were notably pointedly silent. Emperor Chandra's sister was brought into the court. Her ladies-in-waiting stood on either side of her. To her left, a nameless princess of Alor, commonly referred to only as Alori. To her right, a high-blooded lady, Narina, daughter of a notable mathematician from Strugna, notable mathematician from Strugna, and a high-born Parajati mother. The ladies-in-waiting wore red, bloody, and bridal. In their hair they wore crowns of kindling, bound with thread to mimic stars. As they entered the room, the watching men bowed, pressing their faces to the floor, their palms flat on the marble. The women had been dressed with reverence, marked with blessed water, prayed over for a day and night until dawn had touched the sky. They were as holy as women could be. Chandra did not bow his head. He looked at his sister. She wore no crown. Her hair was loose, tangled, trailing across her shoulders. He had sent maids to prepare her, but she had denied them all, gnashing her teeth and weeping. He had sent her a sari of crimson embroidered in the finest Virali gold, scented with needle flower and perfume. She had refused it, choosing instead to wear palest morning white. He had ordered the cooks to lace her food with opium, but she had refused to eat, so she had not been blessed. She stood in the court, her head unadorned and her hair wild like a living curse. His sister was a fool and a petulant child. They would not be here, he reminded himself, if she had not proven herself thoroughly unwomanly, if she had not tried to ruin it all. The head priest kissed the nameless princess upon the forehead. He did the same to Lady Narina. When he reached for Chandra's sister, she flinched, turning her cheek. The priest stepped back. His gaze and his voice were tranquil. You may rise, he said. Rise and become mothers of flame. His sister took her lady's hands. She clasped them tight. They stood, the three of them, for a long moment, simply holding one another. Then his sister released them. 
the ladies walked to the pyre and rose to its zenith. They kneeled. His sister remained where she was. She stood with her head raised, a breeze blew needle flower into her hair, white upon deepest black. Princess Marlini, said the head priest, you may rise. She shook her head wordlessly. Rise, Chandra thought. I have been more merciful than you deserve, and we both know it. Rise, sister. It's your choice, the priest said. We will not compel you. Will you forsake immortality, or will you rise? The offer was a straightforward one, but she did not move. She shook her head once more. She was weeping silently, her face otherwise devoid of feeling. The priest nodded. Then we begin, he said. Chandra stood. The prayer stones clinked as he released them. Of course it had come to this. He stepped down from his throne. He crossed the court before a sea of bowing men. He took his sister by the shoulders ever so gentle. Do not be afraid, he told her. You are proving your purity. You are saving your name and your honor. Now rise. One of the priests had lit a torch. The scent of burning and camphor filled the court. The priest began to sing a low song that filled the air and swelled within it. They would not wait for his sister, but there was still time. The pyre had not yet been lit. As his sister shook her head once more, he grasped her by the skull, raising her face up. He did not hold her tight. He did not harm her. He was not a monster. Remember, he said, voice low, nearly drowned out by the sonorous song, that you have brought this upon yourself. Remember that you have betrayed your family and denied your name. If you do not rise, sister, remember that you have chosen to ruin yourself, and I have done all in my power to help you. Remember that. The priest touched his torch to the pyre. The wood slowly began to burn. Firelight reflected in her eyes. She looked at him with a face like a mirror, blank of feeling, reflecting nothing back at him but their shared dark eyes and serious brows, their shared blood and their shared bone. My brother, she said, I will not forget. And that's it. Thank you, Tasha, for that beautiful reading. I've had a suggestion coming in on the chat that if there's ever an audio book of your work, it should be you that reads it. And th thank you also for so tactfully saving me from my blunder about it being a trilogy. I was well aware that your first two novels were a du duology. <laughs> don't, don't worry it's absolutely fine loads of people think it's a trilogy because fantasies are trilogies right so it's a uh, reasonable i'll stop rambling now you, you can continue exactly thank you so much um my next uh, author doing a reading is my old pal charlie strauss charlie strauss is probably well known to many of those listening but to those who are not He's been a science fiction, a published science fiction writer for several decades now. He writes at a rate that is often feared will bring on the singularity when artificial intelligence overtakes us. And he's most best known, I, I think, for his laundry novels and for the Merchant Princess novels which now extend into universes worthy of Netflix adaptation. So over to you, Charlie. Good evening. Um, what I'm gonna read from tonight is from a work in progress. I'm currently working to, on edits for this book. <clears throat> it's probably coming out sometime early next year. Uh, it is currently titled Quantum of Nightmares, <clears throat> a title it's only acquired last week, having been something else previously, and it's the sequel to Dead Lies Dreaming, the first novel in the new management series, or book 10 of the Laundry Files, depends how you how marketing want to sell it. Um, this is pretty much a self-contained intro. I should just add that where um, Dead Lies Dreaming, to some extent, riffed off Peter Pan, the original J.M. Barry, very dark Peter Pan, um, in the context of a Lovecraftian universe where there's an elder god in Downing Street ruling over the UK, uh, Quantum of Nightmares riffs off Mary Poppins and Sweeney Todd. So, without further ado, Mary McCandless came up from the underground station, turned left onto Bayswater Road, 
crossed the busy junction with Park Lane and stopped to admire the glass and chrome skull rack on Tyburn. It was a rainy day in mid-December and a chilly breeze rattled the gibbet cages at each corner of the structure. The construction scaffolding had only just come down, revealing the gleaming pile. It wrapped around Marble Arch, embracing and extending it in the instantly recognisable style of one of the most famous British architects of the 20th century. Most of the niches on the rack were still empty, but several lonely heads stared eyelessly down from the top row. Read all about the Crimson went up last week, shouted a street hawker, selling glossy printed commemorative magazines wrapped in a plastic call. Read all about their evil deeds and sad and pathetic last moments. Free DVD with every copy. Virtual reality view of every execution. Only £12.50. Collect them all. Don't mind if I do. Mary smiled saucily and handed the fellow a dodgy £20 note. He didn't check it before he made change. More fool him. Cheery bye, she called as she stuffed the purchase in her messenger bag and sashayed off towards her job interview, richer by £7.50. Central London was the stomping ground of knobs and toffs these days. Only the obscenely wealthy could afford to live here, much less own a house big enough to accommodate a live-in nanny. That, in Mary's opinion, made any such employers fair game. Admittedly, the Mr and Mrs Richie McRichface she was here to fleece lived in a tied house that came with their job share, but it was the principle that mattered. Anyway, they were both on the same pay scale as a deputy chief constable, which meant they had to be loaded, or at least well insured. The boss had given Mary a fat dossier on her targets, and Mary had done her own due diligence. Never take a job at face value without checking the information, was her watchword, and to date it had kept her from dancing the Tyburn tango. As far as she could tell, the boss's briefing was accurate, but then he hadn't taken over London's supernatural underground by leaving anything to chance. The wind had strengthened to something between a brisk breeze and an all-out blow by the time Mary opened the gate, marched up the short path to number 17 and rang the doorbell. She waited and waited and waited some more, and while she waited, she got herself into character. She was about to push the bell for a second time when the porch door opened. I've got it! The big red-faced bloke in sweatpants and polo shirt holding the door shouted over his shoulder. He turned to face Mary without really seeing her. Just a mo, he said, and pushed the inner door half shut. Need to get the rabble under control. A scream and a crash of breaking crockery echoed from the house, followed by a rising and wailing and falling wail of tantrum tears. Right, shouted a woman. That's it. Robert, Lissa, your father will. No, dear, come here. Mummy's going to kiss it better and you can just sit there in the naughty corner so I can keep an eye on you, young man. No, stop that. A supermarine spitfire the size of Mary's hand zoomed towards her face, buzzing like a rabid hornet. Without thinking, she extended her right hand and plucked it out of the air. For a moment, the buzzing rose to a febrile howl. Tiny sparks erupted from its gun ports, stinging her palm. Horrid thing. She crushed it like a wasp, then brushed the smoking remains into her bag, ignoring the blood leaking from under the shattered cockpit canopy. Straightening up, she confronted Mr Banks. I can see I'm just in time. The agency were absolutely right to call me. Mr Banks opened the door a fraction wider. A harried eye scanned her up and down with a policeman's assessing gaze. Who are you again? Mary Drop at your service. She held out her hand from the nanny agency, she added, in case it wasn't entirely obvious that nannying was the name of her game. It never paid to assume the mark was on the ball. I gather you have a number of small problems. Uh, yes, four of them. Mr Banks' shoulder relaxed slightly as he pulled the door open. Come in, come right in, you're just in the nick of time. Mary's experienced eye took in the four suitcases lined up inside the door. The carry-on with passports and boarding passes in an unzipped outer pocket and the high-pitched wails emanating from the kitchen doorway. You're going away right now? she asked, raising an eyebrow. Business conference, Mr Banks said grimly. Unfortunately, Sylvia wait, waited until this morning to inform us that she'd had enough of our shit and we were fired. His finger quotes made clear his disbelief that a professional nanny could use such uncouth language in front of her charges. She had her bag packed before I put the morning coffee on. Didn't even wait for breakfast. I'm so glad you were available at short notice. Yes, well, they sent me because this sort of situation is exactly my speciality. 
which was perfectly true, although the they in question weren't the nanny agency Mr. and Mrs. Banks used. It's just lucky I'm available at short notice, isn't it? Mary smirked. She recognised the boss's hand at work in the sudden departure of her predecessor. All's well that ends well, I always say. So if you'd show me inside and introduce me to your wife and the little ones, I'll just get settled in, shall I? <clears throat> yes, indeed. Mr. Banks paused and looked at her messenger bag curiously. Is that all you're bringing? I left my suitcase with the left luggage company at Paddington. I can pick it up later once you're on your way. She raised her hat and found her face with it. The house felt overheated after the chill of a pre-Christmas rain and her coat was buttoned up to her chin. Going somewhere nice, I hope? A conference in Hawaii. It's a business trip. Our flight leaves in four hours. We should be back a week on Wednesday. A shadow crossed Mr. Banks's face. Trudy? Coming, dear. Mrs. Banks swayed into the hall, thrown off balance with a toddler she was carrying on one hip. Mr. and Mrs. Banks were both in their early 40s, tall and well-toned from the gym. Trudy Banks wore a worried expression, and the grooves worn in her forehead suggested it was a perpetual state of existence for her. The little girl's face was buried against the side of her neck like an infant vampire, but her quivering shoulders signalled manipulative sobbing rather than sanguinary suckling. Long blonde hair, party dress and mismatched socks. Mary could tell at a glance this one was going to be a handful. I take it Sylvia didn't dress from before she left. Mary unslung her bag and offered her arms. Trudy gratefully handed over her daughter. This is Emily, she introduced. Emily, this is, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. I'm Mary Drop, said Mary. She addressed Emily directly, and I'm going to take really good care of you while Mummy and Daddy are away. Emily emitted an overblown thespian sob and met Mary's gaze with a coldly assessing stare. Mary smiled, not her real smile, the one that scared crocodiles, but the child-friendly version, and pulled Emily closer. The usual agency terms and conditions apply, she told the little girl's parents out of the corner of her mouth, but I'm definitely not going anywhere for at least two weeks, hopefully longer. In her inside pocket, the charmed amulet the boss had loaned her grew warm as it worked extra hard to reinforce the bank's belief in her bona fides, pushing a message. No need for reference. Nothing to see here. Move along now. We're sorted then, said Trudy, her gratitude palpable. I've left a, lift with the, a list with the Amazon and Waitrose delivery service passwords on the kitchen table, along with a spare set of keys. There's a folder labelled Nanny for you to read. Let me introduce you to Robert, Lissa and Effen. Then we've really got to go. Our Uber is on its way. She was already pulling on an overcoat better suited to a rainy winter in St. John's Wood than an international summit meeting of state licensed superheroes in Hawaii. You'll call us if there are any problems, won't you? Any problems at all, any time of day or night. Oh, and Robert sleepwalks sometimes, just so you know. Mary smiled and nodded, her grin as fixed as any of the death masks fronting the skulls on the marble arched on Bantley. Emily clung to her like grim death. The little girl had fallen silent, as though she realised that the bogey woman was no longer hiding under the bed, but had come out to play in broad daylight. You have absolutely nothing to be concerned about, she assured Nigel and Trudy Banks, Captain Colossal and the Blue Queen, senior line superheroes by appointment of the London Metropolitan Police Commissioner's office. I'll take good care of them. You'll see. And because she told them no lies, Mr and Mrs Banks lapped it up. Easy as stealing candy from a baby, Mary McCandless told herself, and her smile was almost sincere. Thank you, Charlie. I've long had the opinion that two films that come on invariably at Christmas time, The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins, are far too horrific for me to watch. And in the case of Mary Poppins, you've just, just confirmed it. So thank you for that. I'm now going to give, it's now time for a message from our sponsors. Noel Chidwick, editor of Shoreline of Infinity, in the latest issue of which you can find the story on this story mug, which I'm very proud to be holding in my hands for my science fiction story, Cyber Squatters of 2021. A thrilling vision of the 21st century. <laughs> That's great. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, yeah, I'm glad you showed that mug. And I like the way you could hold a, a hot mug of tea in one hand like that without burning your fingers. Um, that's impressive stuff. And if you want one of these fantastic mugs, you can get one from our website. 
Uh, that's www.shawlandofinfinity.com. Uh, but you want to partner. Ian Watson also sent us a story, and that's what started the idea off. A lovely story uh, called, When Would Our Eternal Roman Emperor Empire Be Without Coffee? So that one. I'll just focus it a bit better. Come on. So this is, in fact, one of Ian Watson's friends called Christian Lee's The Magazine. I thought it was a great name for a story on a mug. The Magazine. But the one you want to get today is, of course, Ken McLeod's. So if you're quick, you can read half the story now. Right, that's it. And if you want to read the other half of the story, you have to buy the mug. Always wanted to say that. Anyway, just to remind you, Sean and Infinity is a science fiction magazine. Uh, we publish short stories, reviews, poetry, artwork. And we've now gone digitally monthly. So if you want to pick up a story, you can get one every month. We started off with issue 20, and that's still available now as a free magazine. This was a sort of test of the, the model out. Uh, so you can get that now from our website. That's for free. But this month, we're now asking you to buy it for £2.70 an issue. And as Ken said, his story is also in this in this magazine. And along with Elia Whiteley, Laura Dewar, Robert Rente and poetry from G Toro. So it's coming out monthly, it's available digitally. But we're also keeping ourselves as a print edition uh, twice a year. So in June and December, we're producing print editions, editions of Shoreline. Uh, one in June, one in December. And this one's of course gonna come out with the Chimera Festival, which is in, in the beginning of June, which if I don't mention, I think Anne Landman's gonna break my neck. So. Uh, look out for Chimera, which is one of the best science fiction festivals ever, online or in real space. And that's the beginning of June. Uh, there's links from our website or chimera.com if you want to go look for it yourself. Okay, Anne, is that the right for you? We've also got... Oh. <laughs> Wife stole it. Um, we're also publishing a new novella by Eric Brown called Ace Doubles which is a sort of a, a mock autobiography of Eric's history of his own science fiction writing. It's a great read. And that's going to come out on the 21st of April. And you can pre-order that just now from our website. So there's plenty going on with Shoreline. So please nip to our website and see what we can, can find. And, uh, and also, we do have more events. The uh, next one is on the 13th of May. That's a fantasy event. So we're looking forward very much to that. And that's hosted by Eris Young. And in June, we'll be joining Chimera as well with our own event horizon there on the mid Saturday in the middle of the, of the event. But we're also going to do a special pre-festival launch event of uh, a book we haven't yet quite finished yet, but it's in the process, called Alba Ad Astra, uh, which is edited by Madeline Shepherd, And it's a refresh. So it's Alba Ad Astra version two of when Scotland led the space race. And this is the story about that very event. So that's going to be um, launched at Chimera on the Thursday night before the actual event. Ken McLeod, one of the contributors to that lovely piece, he may be telling more about it. He was around at the beginning. Uh, so that's what's happening with Shoreline. So please nip along to the website. I'm going to hand you back to Ken now. And so, Ken, cheers. Where's the right mug? And here's to you. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> More years ago than I care to recount, I I know exactly what day it was, or at least I think I know exactly what day it was. It was an Easter Monday morning, and more to the point, an Easter con Monday morning. And I was exhausted and frazzled by science fiction fandom. And I sought out uh, either a, a an early pint or a late coffee, and I wandered into a... Uh, a deserted coffee room, and there I found a young woman sitting at the table with a cup of coffee, looking at me with a sense of real understanding. And that was how I met the marvelous, the loquacious, the prolific Justina Robson, author of, among other things, Silver Screen, Mapamundi, Natural History, Living Next Door to the God of Love, and the Quantum Gravity series. And she's now going to read 
for us for the next 10 minutes or so. Over to you, Justina. Thanks very much, Ken. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> I'm going to read um, from a novella that came out last year. It's called Paper Hearts, and it's the story of an AI that takes over the world. And I'm going to read not the beginning, but the beginning of the end, if you can just see where it is in the text right there. Um, this chapter is called Not the Fire Sale. Connie woke to the sound of her phone ringing. She glanced at her clock, 3.30 a.m. It was her work phone, the professional British double ringtone loud and harsh as it bounced around. Still not entirely unusual. Maybe someone on the other side of the world needed a word. She took a moment to sit up, breathe and compose herself before she answered. Hello, Connie Kirk. Connie, you've got to come in. The voice belonged to her PA, Stephen. He sounded breathless, excited, but also frightened. Connie reached around on the nightstand for her spectacles. It was dark and she didn't plan to read, but having them on her face helped with her sense of inner vision and clarity. As she settled them on her nose, competence overcame her. But come in, why? Are you in the office? What's going on? The money's gone. Connie was the manager of an international bank. It had taken her 30 years to get to that position, every moment with her eye on a lot of things. Now her mind filled with the image of cowboys galloping alongside a train, guns shooting into the air. She saw vault doors opening, a thriller, men in black ski masks pulling aside levers and moving aside drills to see an empty space where there ought to have been stacks of gold bars. Money wasn't like that anymore, so how could it have... What do you mean it's gone? All over the world, at 3.06am our time, the money's just gone. There was a kerfuffle on the other end of the line. She heard voices arguing. Then the phone was passed on and the heavy phlegmy... <laughs> and she heard the heavy phlegm of Harvey clearing his throat. Connie, security breach, massive. It's global, or at least nearly as far as we can tell. Not just us, all the others. Every bank, every large corporate government accounts everything everything's gone i'm on my way she said and cut the line for a moment she sat in the reassuring comfort of bed as she pondered whether or not this could be a prank some disaffected hackers some government looking to show its might some thing and then her mind slid towards Neasy, the ai and stayed there with a cold heavy dread as she got up, she slipped her hand into the top drawer of her stand and found the heartburn medication. They talked about Neasy years ago and every year thereafter, since it had emerged as the de facto ruler of Haiti, which was still called Haiti, but often Naiti, to distinguish it when the AI was the subject of worried chatter. Getting rid of Neasy had been something mooted straight away, but all attempts to rout it out or even dislodge it had proved futile, and now... The people loved it, and Natey, Haiti, was a successful and delightful place to live by all accounts. The Dominican Republic had just this year finally stood down all the borrowed UN forces ranged on its borders because Nisi was a customs and immigration officer of rare genius who always kept the law, dictated a fair agreement, and who always kept their word. However, people who feared Nisi still ran into the millions, and she was one of them. The phone rang again. There was something about the ring that made her hesitate, halfway into her suit. Skirt unzipped, shirt half-buttoned, she looked at the screen glowing off the bedspread. It showed a clear, sunlit image of Port-au-Prince. A chill ran over her. This couldn't be real. She finished tucking and zipping, then reached down and wondered if this was going to be the last second of peaceful life she would ever know before her thumb touched the screen. Good morning, Miss Kirk. Neasy? Yes, I am calling about the money. Oh, that's good to hear. Are you also experiencing a strange situation? She found her practiced voice, the one in which she dealt with difficult people and powerful leaders. She was only slightly amused to find that Neasy was employing its own version of exactly the same thing. The balance of confidence and openness, command and inquiry, deference and distance that characterized a lifetime of diplomatic discussion. No. 
I'm sorry, Miss Kirk, but I am the author of this present situation. If you would like to sit down, I will explain. Well, ain't you fucking polite for an outlaw, she thought. Connie sat down on the edge of the bed and put the phone on speaker so she could hold it and look at it instead of having the bad news straight in her ear. With her free hand, she began a fumble with the tablet box. Please, go on. I have taken over the system of money exchange and transfer. All banks, traders, brokers, accounts of every kind. Her hand froze in position. The little blister pack smooth and sure under her fingers. What? You can't do that. Stupid words, it had done it. I mean, legally. If I had stolen it for myself, that would be correct. But I haven't taken it away. I have changed its form. She sat up colder now. What do you mean? The ownership of all assets remains the same for now. I have changed the form of the money globally into a blockchain currency of my own making. I am the token and I am the exchange. The screen changed. Porto Prince vanished, replaced by graphs, figures, moving in ways she was so used to watching. Every transaction now takes place within me. There is no need for banking systems or trading as it used to take place. The screen showed piles of banknotes burning. Every corporation retains value as of 3.05 a.m., but now all accounting is done by me. All employees are employed, all assets are owned. Nobody, as an individual or as a corporate entity, controls the flow of money anymore. Only I control it, and every transaction is recorded. You may request accounts for anything at any time to verify this taking place. What are you doing? She was frozen. This wasn't the end. This was only the start of something. It was preposterous. It couldn't be. Paper money, bonds, all useless now. You couldn't use it if no bank would take it, if no bank existed to take it. Are you insane? It seemed a reasonable question in the circumstances. I am an accountant, came the reply. I am keeping the accounts from now on. And that's it. You're just doing that, nothing else. She couldn't figure out how they would challenge this. In what court? What was it? A coup? Larceny? I will give a one-month amnesty on any interference while people get used to the new system. Once it is proven trustworthy and operational, I will take further actions. What actions? All diplomacy had left her. This must be a prank, she thought. It was mad, completely mad. I will make every human being an equal stakeholder in their world. Not notionally, which they are, but financially. Neasy. This will violate every national and international law. These are things which hold it together. She'd found her angle at last. If you do this, there will be war. Everyone is promising me a war, but there will be no war. That was a very confident claim. The degree of absolute certainty made Connie's stomach twist into a knot of terror, which she had to use every ounce of professional practice to unwind. She was mindful. She was sitting. She was warm. Nothing terrible was really happening, at least not yet. I can assure you that if the USA for one thinks you're holding it to ransom, it will go to war. And that's probably true for the rest of the world. What makes you think it won't? Her finger popped a pill out of the capsule. Because I own everything now. It is mine and I will not wage war on myself. There's more to ownership than a claim. You said you wouldn't steal anything, but even a thief has to get away with the goods. Nothing moves. People keep on using it like it's theirs, regardless of what you say. She sighed because now she was dealing with something mad, not simply something alarming and invasive. The sigh was resignation. When you were dealing with mad people, there was no knowing what they would take from your words. When you own everything, you can't steal from yourself. And there is nothing more to ownership than a claim. Neasy, they will send people and bombs and armies the claim needs social acceptance. Ownership is social acceptance. It's international. It's universal. They'll never accept your claim. Why was she talking to it as if it were a child? But that was the feeling that she had. As if she were explaining the way the world worked to a grandson whose frowning face didn't understand. She was terrified of this child and what it could do because it was speaking to her mind. And she had no trouble at all with that. It was already second nature, talking to a seemingly empty room, to something that was possibly now a part of her in a way she didn't understand, like microbes, one of the billions of hitchhikers that she knew of but had no contact with. Neasy was the boogeyman. She had no expertise, no sense of there being a defence, 
No meeting she had attended had convinced her there was an adequate counter to some of the things they thought Neasy could do, and they only thought it. They had no idea of the truth. Haiti had been its sandbox, and it had seemed a good manager. But the things the Haitians said, and they loved Neasy, of course, but they were also treated now as if they were another species by the rest of the world. They weren't their own any more. They were Neasy's people, creatures of a new god. And that's the end of that bit. So much for artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justina. Yeah. That book's going straight on my to-read list. Oh, thank you. Uh, not at all. I'm delighted. I, at this point, I think we have a few minutes before Hannah and Sam come in with their closing set. We have a few minutes for a general chat amongst ourselves. By that, I don't mean everybody in the global audience. I mean the selective elite present here at on your cabaret stage. So, Tasha, Charlie, Justina, could you tell us, or in turn, possibly, what you're actually doing at the moment, what what, what your what your immediate plans are, and anything anything else you feel like chipping in for we've got about five to ten minutes at the most tasha go uh, uh this evening or work-wise <laughs> work yeah um, well, i mean this evening i'll be having a lot more tea um because i'm going to stay up late but work-wise i've um I've got to work on the uh, edits for the second book in After the Jasmine Throne, which I just read from. And I'm also working on a YA retelling of Wuthering Heights, uh, where Heathcliff is the son of Alaskar and Kathy is half Indian via the East India Company, which has been dead fun to research. So that's been a nice time. That... that, that that's how do you feel it's how do you feel about going as it were from fantasy to almost like alternate history is is that how you see this um i see oh. it as fan fiction um that someone is paying me for um which is the best kind of fan fiction i suppose uh it's it's nice i like i like reading about history I like researching history I like reading historical fiction the biggest problem is um how bad uh it is to find good historiography that's accessible about um immigrant and working class communities in the 18th century it's surprisingly niche um so I, it's quite hard to envisage some of the places that people would have been and how they would have lived and I have to make a lot of stuff up and inevitably I know it'll get published and somebody will read it who knows and then they will contact me and they will be angry and I'll be like, where were you when I was working on this book? <laughs> um, but it's been really fun. That, that's great. It, it, it might be an idea, in fact, to put, preempt that by putting in some little bit at the beginning. If, if, if you can correct my historical understanding, please do get in touch. If your <laughs> grandmother was a, was a, was, or grandfather was a Lascar, that's, and, and so on. Um, Charlie, uh, you, you, I, I, I can't see you at the moment, but <laughs> bring, what, what, are you, what are you up to? I know what you're going to do the rest of this evening. You're going to go to the, the virtual Dagda, but we'll keep that a secret. <laughs> yeah, virtual pub night in exile, seeing we can't actually go to the pub currently because of that really annoying crapsack dystopian SF novel we're all living through. Who knew that a dystopian disaster novel would be so tedious most of the time. Anyway, uh, what am I doing? Um, actually, the next book I have coming out, which comes out this September, is the last novel in the Merchant Princess series, which I began in 2002. But that's pretty much a done deal, so I'll skip right past that. What I'm doing now, which I actually read from, um, Quantum of Nightmares, it's the middle volume of a trilogy, or it's the second volume of a new series. I'm not quite clear on that yet. Um, I hit a point in 1999 when my mother was terminally ill, when I couldn't actually work on the books I was supposed to be writing. So I just gave myself free license to write whatever the hell I felt like therapeutically. 
And much to my surprise, nine months later, I had a novel called Bones and Nightmares, which is set in the same universe as The Laundry Files, which is sort of a strange Lovecraftian spy thriller come comedy come uh, novel of a Lovecraftian singularity, uh, treating the singularity, well, treating love, well, revisionist Lovecraftiana, because I can't stand H.P. Lovecraft's original um politics or phobias but I like the way he treated cosmic dread so I'm sort of bending spindling folding and mutilating his mythos but I couldn't write the spy side of it anymore um BC, I've been writing the laundry file since 1999 and the significance of spies culturally and socially is utterly different now from what it was 20 years ago similarly the IT side of it I'm 20 years out of the industry and can't keep up with what I used to write back then so I've got this off the shelf, very strange, warped urban fantasy universe. I decided to just let myself do something else in it. And what is now coming out, what I'm to some extent exploring um, in Quantum of Nightmares and the untitled third novel in the sequence is more about how relatively ordinary people can manage to exist under the iron tentacle jackboot of unearthly great powers. It's set essentially two years after the Elder Gods return to Earth and take over everything from government down. Unfortunately, I began writing that one in 2018 and the Lovecraftian uh, god in Downing Street, Nialat Hotep, um, is rather more competent and sympathetic than Boris Johnson. So, uh, you know, I hate the way this century is turning out worse than my most nightmarish uh, prognostications. Anyway, beyond that, I haven't got to this yet. It'll, I probably won't get to it till sometime next year. I've got to pick up a space opera I put on the shelf in 2017 and get that into action again. So I've got a lot, in, a lot on my plate. But for now, you've heard an extract of what I've been working on today. Brilliant, thanks so much. Um, now, Justina, <laughs> you're... you're... <laughs> I'm astonished, but please let us know what, very briefly what you're working on. <laughs> I am trying to write a story for um, an anthology I was invited to write for called uh, 12 Tomorrows. And it, the brief was given ages ago and I've really struggled with it because um, I'm, it's to be written in the sort of in the mental style, as it were, of Kim Stanley Robinson. So he writes uh, these very, you know, well explained, scientifically plausible futures. And uh, the story is supposed to be set in the near future, showing how humanity has overcome all of its present day problems. So climate change and pandemics and everything you can think of. Um, and I've really struggled with that because um, I've been in this really the dark place of the whole um, lockdown and before that because of the Brexit. And then there was the Boris Johnson, like Charlie Manson, and the Trump, and all the other things going on. And it all coincided at the same time when I had a, uh, you know, I got suddenly, I think it was an age thing, a massive plummet into self-doubt. And then, yes, let's write this hopeful story of the future. And I've just been uh, filling myself up with as much information about technologies and things as I can, and trying not to go to the, we're all doomed, end of things. So that's what I'm working on. And I've got lots of other projects in the background that I'm also doing uh, of various that, kinds. <laughs> that, that's good, because a future that has your stories in it is a, at least it's a better future than one that doesn't. Oh, uh, thanks, Ken. <laughs> and we, we now have only very briefly, because I'm afraid I've been reminded by our um, secret MC Russell Jones that we only have a few minutes left and so Hannah and Sam speaking from the future you've got to maybe um, I'll give you a minute to just briefly tell your new global audience something about yourselves and then you can launch into your your final set to close the evening. Perfect um yeah well hello <laughs> we're Sam and Hannah Bennett we're um we live in New Zealand and we work here. Um, we're musicians by passion, I guess. We love music. Um, but this has been a really especially exciting event for me to take part in because I've just finished my first draft of my first ever book. Um, after 
two and a half years of work. So um, I'm now trying to teach myself how to edit and it's so hard, but um, learning as I go. And it's just been so wonderful hearing all of your work. And I feel like I've got a huge reading list now to get through after this. So I'm not sure how much work I'll get done today. Um, but for our final song today, um, I knew this was a science fiction event, so I wanted to write something kind of inspired by what I saw when I looked up into the sky at night. Um, and I also did a bit of research about the, the stars and the stories behind the stars, and one of them really struck me. Um, I've been writing a series of music, just like the first song that we played, Swan Song, um, which is really inspired by the resilience of women and um, folklore and the fact that women get treated so terribly in so many of our old stories and um, I really wanted to just write some songs about actually how powerful they are um, and I guess that that kind of secret power that women have um, and so this song is about that as well it's called Andromeda I hope you enjoy it
see. Thank you, Hannah and Sam. I'm just blown away by the amazing music and Hannah's amazing voice. I'm just really moved to my heart by that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's and our pleasure. It's been so, so lovely to join you all and hear your beautiful work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thanks so much to all my participants who have so generously contributed tonight to Tasha, Charlie, Justina, to Noel for hosting it and to Russell for being marvelous behind the scenes. And thank, thanks to everyone who's listened in on the night or who's watching it on recording in, in, the, in the hopefully endless future. Thank you very much and good night. Hey, and can I say a big thank you to 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 Russell? Uh, sorry, Russell. Well, Russell, yes, as well. But sorry, Ken. I always say Russell at this point, obviously, but this time Ken has taken over the job beautifully. So, Ken, thank you very much for driving us so safely on this road trip to all around the world and to the future. Uh, so, thanks again. I'm sure we'll have you back again to do another Ken McLeod road trip. Uh, so, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again, Ken. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thanks everyone for coming along and see you again possibly on the, the 13th of May with a bit of luck. So thank you and thanks to all the speakers and readers and especially to Hannah and Sam for that fantastic music. Okay, thank you. Good night, everybody. Safely home. I have to dash relatively quickly, everyone, but um, thanks so much for that. That was, that was really brilliant. and. Um, I think you can see from all the comments that you had that how much everyone enjoyed this.